So hopefully this works. Okay. Um, and hopefully everybody can read this. Um, this is the this is the template and size that I that I use for all of my talks because I decided I liked it. <clears throat> okay, so before I get going real quick, um, how many people here would say they either don't know what Capybara is or have heard of it and never used it, right? So basically non-users of it. Right? So all right. uh, for the rest of you, um, I'm probably not going to cover a ton of new ground because it turns out that to do an advanced talk on Capybara, which I think could be interesting to do, ends up being a ton of showing code and potentially making it very Kata-like and not very presentation-like. So I want to make this more presentation-like to try and cover what Capybara is, not really where it came from, but what it's for and why you want to use it. Um, and then at the end, I've got a couple of examples of what Capybara tests um, when combined with our spec could look like, but they're not running examples, they are they are examples to illustrate what the syntax is for and how it works. Let's see if we're working. Okay, so um, so I titled the test "What's Capybara?" because um, that's a capybara. Um, and it turns out that a capybara is the largest of all living rodents, and the name apparently means "master of the bathrooms. Things you learn when you search on Google for research. I don't know why this is, but. Remember this image is going to come back later. <laughs> all right. So, so what we're really not talking. So we're not talking about what's a capybara. We're really talking about what is capybara, right? So the the the, the one sentence summary of capybara is a Ruby acceptance test framework for rack-based web applications. Okay. And I'm not really sure that says a lot because sort of you know acceptance test, right? I mean you know what's what's an acceptance test? Okay. So. The one sentence summary for that is, it's a test whose purpose is to verify the functionality of your application from the point of view of a user who's using it. Okay, so that's kind of the key concept here about what Capybara is about, what acceptance tests are about, and why they can be useful. Um, but, you know, don't we kind of have a lot of tests already? I mean, we've got the model layer, and it's got tests that we already sort of know about, and we've got the controller layer, and it's got more tests that we sort of already know about. And if you want to get even further, you can actually write tests specifically for your views. Don't do this. Um, and you need to go higher and write tests for your routes. You get really complex routes, right? Well, I'm going to say don't do that either. Um, part of the issue here with all of these tests and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each of them. So let's talk a bit about the route layer. Your routes are how the users who are interfacing with your application's user interface get to your app to do stuff, right? Well, they're already doing a lot. They're, they're parsing the incoming URL stream. They're figuring out which controller and which action on that controller to call. They're setting up any uh, URL path arguments are already doing enough. So I'm not really sure that we should be putting any business logic in our routes if we can really avoid it. And I know there's an argument for doing it if you do a lot of multi-tenancy stuff. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I 100% agree with that. I'm willing to have the argument, but I don't know if I fully agree with it. Um, for those of you who are at one of my previous talks where we talked about refactoring views to get the business logic out of your views because you shouldn't have it there because the views are also already doing way more than they need to. So let's get rid of the view layer tests. So I'm going to make a case that we should probably try to get rid of controller layer tests as well. Okay. Now, this is a much larger, much more contentious topic. I just want to say right now, I love where you're going with this. Thing. Okay. <laughs> of course you do. But what I'm going to say, what I'm going to say is, if you if you really believe in the concept of skinny controller fat model, then what you're really saying is controllers in Rails already do a ton of stuff. 
if we can keep some of the business logic out of them and let them just do what it is they do, then we don't actually have to write tests to verify that all of the conditional stuff that we're no longer putting in the controllers is doing stuff. Now, that leads to really, really fat models, okay? Um, and you can make a case that maybe you should spread some of that out, and that's also an interesting topic, but that's not really the, to the topic here. What we're really talking about is, um, if all we've got down here are tests for our model, because we've driven all of the business logic out of here, right? Well, that can give us good coverage of very, uh, sort of a deep inside look at the functionality of our application. But then the problem is, all we're doing is testing our app from the point of view of us, the developer. And we're not actually the users, right? Users don't think like we do, right? They want different stuff from our apps than what we're necessary, right? We're building stuff for them to get value from, right? They get value from using the applications that we build, okay? This is going somewhere, believe it or not. Um, and it eventually gets back around the cap bar, even though we've left cap bar in the dust at the moment. Come on, keep up with me. There we go. So, so what does user value in our web apps look like? Where does it come from? How is it, how is it conceived of inside of our apps? Well, it turns out it's sort of this stuff, right? It's stuff that lives in the browser layer, right? You, it's delivered via the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript of the rendered page. It's got, you know, your content on your page, your links, the forms, the buttons. It's how the user interacts with your app to get it to do stuff. And they derive value through those interactions that they have with the elements that are rendered on the browser page. Okay, well, if that's the case, then don't we need to shift our focus to verifying that the value we're trying to deliver to the users through the browser interface does what we know the users have told us or that we believe they want to do, right? Don't we need to verify that we're delivering the value we want our users to get from our applications? So how do we do that? Okay, so here's a hint. Sitting with Safari or Chrome open and hitting Command R to refresh the page every time you change something in the code that's not how you do this, okay? So if you're doing it that way, and I did it that way for years, I'm here to tell you you're actually doing it wrong, okay? Because that's not repeatable, it's not automated, it's, it, it, it's just not the right way. Okay, so that sort of brings us back to this concept of acceptance tests. And acceptance tests with Capybara, because that's that's an important part of doing acceptance tests within Ruby. Um, the idea behind acceptance tests, and I don't have my, my little helper up to show me what the next slide is, and that's bad, because I've only run through this whole thing once. Acceptance tests are a concept that's been around for a long time, okay? Um, it kind of came out of the extreme programming movement back in the early 90s, and it's based around um, the concept of describing what a user wants to do and then writing code that drives your application like the user would trying to do the thing they want to do. Okay, so let's take a look at what acceptance tests with Capybara can do for us, right? Um, it'll help us automate a browser to behave kind of like a user would behave. Um, uh, as we mentioned way, way at the beginning of the meetup, um, you actually get the ability to drive two different types of browsers. You can drive a headless browser where um, stuff just happens in the background and you don't see it go and you sort of trust that the link was clicked or the button was clicked or the form was filled in. Um, or you can use the Selenium web driver to drive Chrome or Safari or Firefox and actually watch it fill the stuff in for you as it's running through the tests. Um, Capybara is nice because it actually integrates with all of these tools. Um, I'm not talking about test unit and I'm not talking about Cucumber. Um, those are other topics. We're going to focus on the RSpec side of things. Um, just because the way that 
capybara's matchers are written is very RSpec-like in its syntax, and so it melds really well with RSpec. Um, and this is kind of an important concept, although it relates to three side slides that I actually deleted from this talk just before I started, so bear with me here. Um, it lets us drive the functionality that we build into our web applications from the outside perspective, not our perspective as the developer, because we view the app from the inside out, right? But our users, our customers, view our app as I go to this page and it lets me see and do stuff. And that's how we need to express the actual functionality that our applications are delivering, right? That's the goal of acceptance tests. Okay. <clears throat> so how do we write acceptance tests? What, what goes into them? Um, well, it turns out that we write acceptance tests by answering a whole bunch of questions about stuff, right? So what's the role of the user who's trying to use our app? Is it a visitor? Is it someone we don't know about? Is it a, 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 um, a registered user? Is it an administrator? What's their role? Who are they? Uh, it's sort of more what are they rather than who are they because um, if both Judd and I are administrators, it might not matter which of us is doing the thing. What matters is that it's an administrator doing it. What feature, what functionality are they trying to access? And then how does the user who accesses that functionality verify that they succeeded in doing what it was they tried to do? How do they know they got the value they wanted to get? Finally, in order to do it, in order for us to automate, we need to be able to break down this process into a series of steps as the user would be going in the browser to do them and then um, figure out, in order for those steps to actually be performed, What's the state our application needs to be in? What, what resources need to be in place? What records in the database already have to be there? Um, and, and so as you can see, there's quite a bit of stuff here. Um, there's a whole lot more. And this is just to write a single acceptance test. There's a whole lot more here than you're probably used to doing when you're writing a unit test in one of your models, right? So one of the nice things is it turns out that these top three things when looked at as a concept, are in fact a concept, right? They're a concept called a user story. And so a user story is a way to um, describe functionality that you want to add to your application, okay? And they are the first step on the road to writing an acceptance. The functionality is always expressed from the user's point of view, right? You state a goal, um, and you describe the feature and what's needed to succeed in doing that goal. Um, and the normal narrative sort of reads like this, right? As a user role, in order to accomplish some goal, I need to perform this feature within the application. Okay. And um, these user stories, when looked at sort of as a collection, define the parameters under which we're going to write and verify our acceptance tests. All right, so on to some concrete stuff. User story examples. I got a couple. So let's talk about the top app. Okay. Um, now it's a fairly simple app. It doesn't do a whole lot except in a couple of really weird areas. But it still has functionality that can be expressed in a user story way, right? So um, one of the things that um, hopefully everyone does um, when they read through the list of topics is vote for ones that they'd like to see get presented, right? We had 12 or so people vote for, vote for what they thought this talk was going to be, and I'm sure they're all confused <laughs> right now, but there you go. <clears throat> so, so what does that look, what does voting for a topic look like as a user story? Right? So there's a couple ways of stating it, but this is one way you can state that. Everybody with me? More or less? Okay. So let's go into another quick example. By the same token, if you go to the topic list and you don't see a topic there that covers a talk you'd like to see presented, you can suggest a topic. Right? 
So what does that look like? Well, it's actually simpler because suggesting top is actually very, very simple. Um, Uh, and this one could be written a little better. It doesn't really state what a success criteria would be. So that could be a little better, but that's what happens when you add something at the last minute. Um, but there you go. And then um, just to uh, add a slightly more complex one, um, the thing that's been driving a lot of the work we've been trying to do on the project side is this idea of assigning bonus points to first time presenters. Um, and so I thought it'd be interesting to sort of take a, a crack at what this might read as, as a user story. Um, and so uh, here's sort of what I came up with. I think it kind of captures what we're talking about, but then I do a better job of uh, putting in the actual success criteria here. So like I said before, user stories are the starting point for how we're going to drive out acceptance tests. Okay. Um, right, but so you know, what's this have to do with cat bar? Because we sort of left cat bar about seven minutes ago. And it's probably a good idea to get back to it, right? So um, so <laughs> for reasons I don't understand, it's huge. People keep capybaras as pets. They also raise them on farms. So there's some sort of weird combination of like a llama and a huge hamster that doesn't have a cage. I don't too. really get it. Just, just don't get it. Okay. So, so capbar, what does capbar give us in the whole acceptance testing thing? Right? So it gives us the ability to drive the browser to interact with our application. It gives us tools to visit URLs to find and follow links and click on them, just like a user would. Uh, we can interact with forms that are on the page, um, fill them in, uh, select stuff, submit them. Um, we can also inspect the HTML of the page to search through it. We can search through it to find elements, to find tags, to find content. And we can search it using either the CSS that helps to find the structure or um, XPath, which is a way of traversing an XML vocabulary that can be useful at certain times, but is really obtuse if you're not into geeking out on that kind of stuff. Um, but the really nice thing is it provides a set of matchers that are designed to work with both RSpec um, as well as Test Unit and Cucumber to verify that elements or content exist on the page, or if you like, don't exist on the page, as a way to verify that the functionality that was performed resulted in the result you wanted. Um, so Capbar provides a, um, a headless browser for driving rack apps. Um, it's, actually built, it's actually an extension that they've added to rack test. Um, it works pretty well, but it doesn't support JavaScript. Um, so if you need JavaScript support out of a box, you can use Selenium. Um, I'm not a huge fan of it because I don't like watching it open the web window and run through it. If I've got 40 acceptance tests, I don't want to watch it open and start making my browser window go nuts. So um, I tend to prefer headless ones. Uh, the one that I use the most whenever I'm doing JavaScript stuff is Cockbar WebKit. Um, that's what this is for. Um, and it has a nice little bit of side integration with a gem called Launchy. And what this lets you do is, while you're working through the steps of your acceptance test, you are changing the state of the page that you're working with. Right? You're adding a form field, you're clicking on a link, and it's taking you to a new page. You're doing a bunch of different stuff. Sometimes an error can happen in a capybara test where the cause of the error is non-obvious. And so one of the things you can do is you can say, well, I know what's kind of happening in this test here. What does the page look like just before I check to see if my end condition was met? And so Capybara, like using Launchy, gives us a way to snapshot that page and open it up in your browser so you can see 
what a user would see if they'd gone through the steps that you just um, worked through in Kevlar. Um, so that's kind of nice, and it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to see if the page looks like it should look, in addition to figuring out, is it functioning the way I want it to function? Okay, so we're gonna run through some examples here, um, and then I'm going to open it up if there are any questions, um, uh, maybe have a bit of a discussion before we head to PTs, where we will have, I'm sure, more discussions. Okay, so back when I was showing the user story examples, right? We had the, the, the example here for voting for a topic, right? So this is the user story, right? And that's a good starting point, but it's not what we would run a test on um, unless you really, really buy into the cucumber stuff. And again, we're not having that conversation right now. Okay, but this is actually the RSpec plus bar example that could make that test run. And if you're familiar with RSpec, if you've been doing any kind of TED or any kind of uh, Rails testing, most of this looks really familiar. In fact, in for this for this test case, um, these are the only things that cap bar had. It actually requires very little to do the process of a user voting on a topic to verify that they actually voted, right? One second. Yeah. Now this takes this takes advantage of the fact that I'm creating a brand new topic here with no votes, so I know it starts at zero votes, right? So, and if it's the only topic I've got, and I create and I vote on it, then I will there will be only one occurrence of one vote appearing on the page because that's all I care about, right? Did it record the vote? Was I, was I successful in voting on the topic? So, another example. So, the suggesting a topic user story, right? That was a little bit more involved. Because even though the actual functionality from the standpoint of the user is simpler, because it's a two item form, programmatically interacting with that form actually takes a bit more work. Um, and so, in this instance, we start up here, and we, right, we visit the page that has the new form. We fill in the two fields, and then we click the Create button. After that happens, now we want to examine the page and make sure the page is showing us the stuff that verifies we were able to create the topic we tried to create. And so um, I wanted to show one of the nice things that you can do um, with Capybara is this block here, this is Capybara letting us focus in the scope of our have content, right? So we're not now looking at the entire page. We're only looking at the content that's within the CSS ID topic, right? So there's a div on the page whose ID is topic, and now, these have contents only look within the bounds of that div, right? So if we're on a page that's got multiple similar items, this gives us a way to focus in and say, did the change happen in the place where I know it was supposed to happen? Okay. And that's, okay. So the talk doesn't have a great ending. Yeah. It's still new. Like I said, I only got to run through it once. Okay. Um, but that is the talk on, on what I think Capybara is and why I think it's a useful thing. We didn't get to a lot of Capybara in practice, so it's hard for me to really um, drive home its real usefulness, but that's a, an, a, a, a semi-beginnerish intro overview of Capybara. Okay, questions? Who's up first? Who's up first? Nick, Nick, sorry, you need me to go back to that? Yeah, just that page too is fine. The login as helper. Yep. Do you write that with Capybara to this helper, or do you just stop? It depends on the nature of your authentication mechanism, right? If your authentication mechanism is a name and password form within your site, then yeah, I would do it as a form, as a as a set, as a preceding form fill in. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, for the topics app. Um, because we use Meetup, 
Um, we just need to create the idea of a logged in user. Okay. The way you're setting it up here in RSpec is different, I think, fundamentally from how we've been training ourselves to do RSpec tests all the rest of the time. Now you're doing a bunch of tests, especially on the next one, you're doing yes. a bunch of tests in a single yes. shift. And I, so from playing with Kathy Bear over the last two days, I know that if you don't do that, it's extremely slow because yes. it has to redo the whole page for each, for each one. So what? It's a trade-off. It's a trade-off. What do we do? <laughs> um, a lot of it, a lot of it depends on. So the reason I did this here, and I'll bring up the, the bar here. These three things are actually, you're, you're looking at a little bit of belt and suspenders checking here. Okay. Um, I don't need to look for that flash message, right? Because I'm either on the page that has the new topic, or I'm not on the page that has the new topic. Um, and so, because I've done this kind of restriction of the within, these two, these two expectations and the within block together end up being the single check in this instance, right? But you're correct. It depends on the nature of the functionality that you just exercised and whether or not it creates a single change or multiple changes in the resulting page you land on when you're done, right? So if, if the one thing you did creates multiple changes, then in my opinion, you need to run, you need to have them as separate its. But if it does one thing and you're doing a sort of expanded verification of the one thing, you don't. So I feel like typically I'd want to go to a page and check about a hundred different things about that page. <laughs> so Correct, but, but, most of, the, but most of the time, when you're, when you're setting up your tests, um, this kind of feeds back into what Alex and I were talking about before. You're only creating enough persistent objects to exercise the one functionality that you're testing at that point in time. Right? And so ideally, that's going to focus in the amount of change into a smaller surface area. Doesn't mean you won't have more than one test and that it won't be, and that you won't want to still rerun the whole thing each time. I don't know if that, I'm not sure if that's the answer to Jason. This, so this kind of points to, um, there's like a fundamental difference between acceptance testing and unit testing. In that in acceptance testing, you're generally testing a complete user story. And one of the, one of the actual problems, with, you went blank there. One of the actual problems with doing acceptance testing within the RSpec framework is that it's not really set up for that. That's one of the, one of the few arguments I have for using uh, Cucumber for test, doing your acceptance testing in Rails is because Cucumber, you, you do this whole script and each little thing that you're asserting is actually a separate test, but it depends on all of, the, all of those steps. Yeah, the, 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 given, the givens and the whens are held and then the thens independently check against it, which is different than how our spec does. Right. So that that is a that that is a potential advantage to to cucumber in terms of the way it handles the the context of the newly rendered page post feature block. Mm -hmm. It'd be neat if there was. It'd be nice if there was a way in, if our spec had like a mode where you could have a bunch of yeah. you could have a sequence of tests that like you. If it was set up for acceptance testing, basically. Right. Yeah, this gets out of hand real quick. Yeah, it does. So in the world of test driven development, we actually have uh, we actually have kind of a divide in our where I work where we have back end engineers and front end engineers. The back end engineers don't know anything about there's going to be a topics div or anything like that beforehand. So there's no way for them for anyone to write acceptance tests beforehand except for the front engineers. The front engineers don't know really what they're going to be doing until the back engineers. So now you've kind of got to this kind of great scenario where no one can write something trust until everything is done. Okay, so so <laughs> so the you're making an important point, but I actually think you're wrong. I am not. 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 I am